Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here. Thanks again so, so much for joining me. Now in this video, what we're gonna be looking at is the second in our two theories of sleep and dreams. This one is called the reorganization theory, or it's sometimes written as the reorganizational theory. Either way, it's the same thing. Now just to remind you, this is mandatory course content. That means in an exam situation, you could be asked about this theory directly by name. So we need to understand it and we need to understand what it tells us about sleep and dreams. So let's dive straight in. The reorganizational theory was proposed by Crick and Mitchison, 1983. Now Crick himself, that's Francis Crick, he is a bit of a, a, a biology hero if you like. He's one of the first men to discover the, uh, the structure of DNA. So he's got a bit of scientific credence behind him. So he throws his hat into the ring here and says, oh, I reckon I understand what sleep and dreams is about. And he comes up with this phrase here. Crick and Mitchison say, we dream in order to forget. For this reason, it's sometimes called the reverse learning theory. It's a kind of weird thing for cognitive science to do here in saying that, well, rather than learn something, what we're doing is forgetting something. But this is exactly what the reorganizational theory is telling us. Let's have a look at how the, th the thinking behind this works. What we have to do here is understand that there are two main categories or classes, if you like, of memory. The main kind are called adaptive memories. And you can think about adaptive memories as useful memories. These are skills that you've learned. These are relevant bits of information, things that you want to remember, somebody's name perhaps, or the directions to somebody's house or a place of work. These are going to be useful for you. But there's also the second kind of memory, things which aren't as useful. Francis Crick and Mitchison, he called these parasitic memories. These are useless memories, things that are gumming up inside your mind, things that you don't really need or, or don't really need to use um, later on in your life. Things like, for example, what was the colour of the bus driver's uniform on the way into work this morning? Wait, you don't really need to remember that, but that could be a parasitic memory, something that's gumming up inside your brain and is wasting energy, time and resources. So according to the reorganizational theory, what's happening here is that when you fall deep asleep, we're talking REM sleep here, the mind is actively preventing parasitic memories from forming. Or if they've already formed, it destroys them. So the whole idea of this is that sleep is basically pruning your mind. It's kind of getting rid of all the chaff. It's only keeping the good stuff behind. Well, how does it do this? Think about REM sleep. During REM sleep, even though you know your brain's heavily active, you are pretty much switched off from the outside world. There is no incoming connection whatsoever, meaning your brain, your mind, essentially, is its own solitary unit. Now, during REM sleep, the brain stem, that's the medulla, this is this section at the bottom of your brain here, very important, sends random but very, very powerful stimuli up the brain stem and into the cortex. Remember, the cortex is the, the outside part of the cerebrum at the top. Now, this would explain a couple of things. This would explain why there is so much brain activity during REM sleep. It's all these random and powerful signals coming up from the brain stem. The more these signals start to be powered through into the cortex, the more these neural connections, so basically the more these memories, weaken. The more it does it, the more they are cut off from one another. Remember your brain, it works in a series of links. That's how it likes to remember stuff. So the more links that you start to sever, the more connections that you start to destroy, the more those memories will be destroyed. Hopefully you've all seen this movie. This is the absolutely wonderful Pixar film Inside Out. It is incredible, both from a kind of entertainment perspective and from a psychological perspective as well. It gets quite a lot of stuff pretty much bang on the money, which is pretty cool. Now, I won't spoil it for you if you haven't seen Inside Out before, but just be aware that this scene here is pretty much spot on the money when we're talking about reorganizational theory. Basically, the character here, Joy, is inside somebody's mind and she's 
watching as memories are pruned away. This happens when the main character, Riley, is asleep. So the more that Riley's asleep, the more these memories are slowly getting destroyed. And these are memories that Riley doesn't really need anymore, things from her childhood. I won't say any more because well, I'm getting quite emotional up in here, but just believe me, it's a great film, you should go and see it. Now think about these random signals from the brainstem for a second. This is basically activation synthesis, if you remember it. All these powerful signals coming up from the brainstem, well, as they are crashing through the cortex of the brain, it makes sense that they're going to activate some pretty random things along the way. Random images and things you've seen and people that you know about and all these kind of things. So, according to Crick and Mitchison, of course dreams are going to be random, bizarre, illogical, really, really weird, because the stimuli from the brainstem are random. They're also bizarre. They're also illogical. This is what dreams are. These are just random images that just so happen to be twigged as the brain is pruning memories inside your mind. What evidence have we got for this theory? Well, we've got a couple of bits of evidence, actually. We have these two mammals here. This is the spiny anteater, sometimes called the echidna. It's a very strange thing. It's an egg-laying mammal. And we also have the bottlenose dolphin down below. Now, both of these animals are peculiar because they cannot... REM sleep. Yes, they can sleep, but they can't REM sleep. We know that from looking at their brain. We know that from looking at EEGs. Now, at the same time, both of these mammals have a very, very abnormally large cortex. Are the two things linked here? Well, let's imagine they are for a second. If they can't REM sleep, well, it makes sense that they do have a large cortex because they cannot unlearn. They have to store everything they have ever seen and heard. Now, this is probably a pretty grim place to be if you're inside the, the dolphin's cortex because there's going to be all these memories getting gummed up and a whole lot of stuff to kind of filter through. But presumably, that's why they have the large cortex because they cannot REM sleep and therefore they don't get these signals from the brainstem and they cannot unlearn. Quite interesting. This might also explain why it's very difficult to remember dreams. Remember the whole kind of thing, you wake up and you've got all these images flashing through your mind and as soon as you go to tell someone about it, turns out you've forgotten what it was. Well, that might explain why, because we are supposed to forget dreams. We are supposed to forget the images that are being flashed up inside of you. Any more evidence for this? Well, yes, there is. Crick and Mitchison and a little bit of um, extra evidence for their theory. They ran something called a neural network. A neural network is basically uh, an artificial brain. It's lots of individual computers or, or software linked together. And it's a machine that learns in the same way that we do. What happens here is the neural network likes to learn, same as we, but it gets easily overloaded. Memories start to get gummed up. Memories start to get too much. There's all this useless stuff that the computer starts to find. So what actually happens is the neural network starts to reverse learn. It starts to actively undo all of the useless memories that it has. And this is a computer doing it. So the computer likes to do it that way. If the computer learned to actively unlearn things, remember your brain is effortlessly more complicated and more complex than a computer. So it stands to reason that we know how to do that too. Let's evaluate this theory for a second, guys, because again, this seems to be pretty good. Remember the other theory we looked at? The restoration theory it tells us something about the slow wave stages of sleep and maybe a little bit about REM, but it doesn't really tell us all that much about clearly why we dream. Well, perhaps is this the clear theory of why REM sleep is needed? Dreams are nothing more but these illogical, bizarre, random pulses from your brainstem as you're actively unlearning. Seems to be the only one so far that does explain them. Here's an interesting thought, though. If we are actively unlearning, well, how does your brain know which memories it needs to unlearn? How does it know which ones to keep? What if it makes a mistake? Yeah, you want to forget the, the colour of your teacher's tie that morning, but what if you forget how to hold a fork? Or what if you forget or actively unlearn how to tie your shoelaces? How does the brain know what's good and what's bad? It doesn't. Well, at least we can't explain it. If the stimuli from the brainstem are truly random as well, 
And why do your dreams seem to tell you a little story? Why do they have a clear beginning, middle and end? Why do they have a clear narrative running through them? If they were truly random, they would just be images, shapes and figures, but they're a little story. Why should that be? And lastly, this is computer science we're talking about here. Yeah, it's all well and good that a neural network has learned how to unlearn, but does that mean that we unlearn too? This isn't really based on human psychology. We don't have nearly enough evidence to say that this truly does happen inside humans. So until we do have that, this will only ever be a theory. It's only ever a collection of maybes and I supposes rather than true scientific fact. That's everything for this video, guys. Thank you so, so much for watching. In our next video, it's going to be the last one on sleep and dreams, and we're going to be looking at the applications of sleep research. But until then, guys, have a lovely, lovely day, and we'll see you again next time.